This is the Virginia Beach Police Department. You're going to be tested physically. You're going to be tested emotionally. You're going to be tested psychologically. And we absolutely are going to test your integrity. Nothing will be given to you. Period. We do water safety. Is Virginia Beach full of water? You wouldn't think it. I mean, I know we're the beach, but you wouldn't think that oh, we have to get in the pool and basically know what it feels like to drown and be wet. We try to prepare our recruits for the potential of water in patrol. Whether you're in immaculate shape or not, swimming is very, very difficult to do. The dive team will come in and take them to the pool to see what their abilities are and demonstrate that not everybody has the ability to go into the water to save someone. My title is Sergeant Brian Ricardo, and I'm assigned to Police Special Operations. You guys have a long day with the Ricardo experience, so you might as well start loosening up now. When I took over the Marine Patrol and Dive Team, one of the collateral duties for that is teaching the recruit class, the water safety class. Some classes come in and they're very proficient in the water. Some classes come in and they have zero experience. <laughs> I don't swim. <laughs> I can do a couple laps, but after that I'm done. I just sink. We go through a series of drills and exercises with them to tire them out at first. So they do a couple lengths of the pool, different strokes. They've got a certain amount of time they got to tread water. I didn't like the whole treading water for 10 minutes thing. Especially when they pressed that brick around. I was like, okay, well, this sucks. I absolutely loved it. That was definitely one of the best parts of my training so far. It's a good day of training and it opens, I think, a lot of their eyes as far as what the possibilities are, especially with all the water that's in Virginia Beach. They've told us repeatedly that every precinct has some kind of body of water, if not multiple bodies of water in it. The water survival was a different beast entirely. I'm good at floating, not so good at swimming underwater. <laughs> Let's go, Suda! And that was just discovered recently when uh, we had to retrieve a dummy from the 12-foot section of the pool. You know, I love being in the water, I love swimming. But when you add the stress of trying to save someone's life, it played a mental game in my head. I was holding my own very well. But when it came down to helping someone in that situation, that's when I was like, you know, maybe this is where my limit is. But that's just something I need to work on. I'm gonna have to get swimming lessons because <laughs> to get over this and to, to be better. I tried majority of the things, but I knew some things I was like, I can't do this because of my skill level. Having background of being a lifeguard, I wasn't as like nervous as some of the people, I guess. And it was interesting to like see how some of the recruits did. You know, they're like really like gym nuts, and then like seeing them in water. Harrington, I hadn't seen him really afraid of much this academy. You know, I'm pretty good friends with him, and he, he was not looking forward to it. He was watching YouTube videos the night before on how to swim and trying to mentally prepare himself. I was very strong while seeing people that are, you know, pretty much better than me at everything, and I was like. I can at least outswim you. <laughs> I think the most difficult part that they find is, is that number one, you know, when they're training in the water, we've got them in t-shirts and shorts. And then by the end of class, I put a 15 or an 18 pound weight belt on them that simulates going in the water with all of your gear. That four hours that I have them in the pool is really, yes, it's some exercise and it actually gets them out of the classroom and it's fun but it's really a thinking exercise because you know you never know when you're gonna get that call that you've gotta go and effect a rescue in the water. It's an eye-opening experience. Like if someone's out there or about to drown, doesn't do them or you any good if you can't swim a lick and you go out there and you try to save them. You have a choice to make when you respond to a call for something in the water. Um, the decision's very simple. Am I going in the water or am I not going in the water? If I'm going in the water, then what am I wearing and what am I taking with me? If I'm gonna go in the water and I'm gonna take off my gun belt and my vest and my communications equipment and my shirt and my boots, what are you gonna do? Knowing whether to take your gear off or not to, to go in uh, and to save an individual, 
is something that you need to always retain in the back of your mind. That one time you might have to go in to save somebody, you know, you got all these civilians in there, you don't know if your gun or any weapon of yours is gonna be there when you get back. Sergeant Ricardo, he was just like, I'm glad you pushed through it. I'm proud of you, I respect you for pushing through it and keep your head up, it's almost over. I'm not even a sworn officer yet and already having that support is great. It's really a family. Got to you know, realize these are the people I want to surround myself around. If you're gonna be in law enforcement, why not protect and serve the area that your family resides in, an area that you're familiar with, and more so, an area that you're proud of. Virginia Beach has the largest aspect of, you know, different police fields. Uh, Career-wise, my plan was always the detective bureau. I really want to do mounted. It'd be interesting to be an SRO, a school resource officer. I want to do the SWAT team. The ready response team, I'm pretty sure I want to go out for that. Each time we'll have like, you know, the different units come and talk to us, and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, that would sound cool. And then I'll have another unit come and I'm like, that one sounds cool too. So I'm like, there's so many different like units where I'm like, I would love to like try a variety of them. Back in the 80s, we had a riot down at the oceanfront. And ever since then, crowd management has been a big priority of making sure that we're properly trained in case it ever happens again. I thought it was great training. It's something that we need to experience and it's something that you don't really get or understand until you're put in that position. My least favorite of the academy, those, those two days. To understand how formations are put together and the, the intimidation factor that we are essentially to establish to reinstate peace, I think it's great proper movements and line formations with riot batons, riot shields, riot helmets. There are bottles filled with water and tennis balls that are thrown at them just to kind of simulate that people are going to be throwing stuff at you in a riot environment. There was so much going on there. In our situation, we had, what, 20, 20 to 30 people, and as soon as they take control of that one fight, another fight breaks out. Individuals, when we were doing officer victim car rescues, while we are waiting to go, just seeing people just have water bottles that completely explode on them and stuff. It's real. And there's gonna be other things. I mean, they're just throwing tennis balls and water bottles. You're talking about bricks, rocks. And they just had buckets and buckets of water because I was like, when are they gonna run out of water? To work with the mounted patrol, super cool. You know, talk about clearing a crowd quickly. When we had to do those scenarios where we had to swing our stick with a purpose to get people from getting in a car, I did really well and one of the role players was like, I'm not going anywhere near you because the way you swing that stick, I am not getting hit. You're swinging the stick and you're thinking to yourself, it's like, this guy's a cop and we're going to be brothers at one point. I don't want to just wail on him as hard as I can with this wooden stick because what happens if I hurt him? You know, then that guy's like on light duty and you know, it, it, it plays with your head and I think they were getting mad at us for not hitting people. Swing the stick with a purpose! Let's clean up these little issues. There were several times where I was swinging my stick and I'd hit a role player, and I would try not to hit them as hard. You know, it's all immediate, you try not to aim for joints, just like you're trained not to. But you know, you give them a little tap, they don't move. You tap them a little harder, they're still not moving. It's, all right, well, now I'm gonna hit you, I mean. I was trying to tell my fellow recruits, you know, they're throwing these tennis balls at you and stuff like that, and you see my, you see my classmates, you know, they're trying to dodge and weave them and stuff like that, and it's kind of throwing them off, and they're getting their sticks taken, or, you know, they're breaking through the line, stuff like that. You know, you've got this protective equipment on, use it. It was tough for all of us to work together, 45 people without one person messing up. I know two recruits, like, broke a taillight on one of the police cars. And you know, they, that kind of got them like, oh, we're gonna be in trouble, we broke a taillight kind of thing. When real life riot situation, do you think anybody cares about that car? The really crappy part was all the emergency gas situations where they would just throw a can of CS gas into the middle of us and just pop off. And then also on the final day, they have to be exposed to gas, where they go into a gas house, cover groups at a time, they have to demonstrate their gas mask works. And after they show that it works, they have to remove the gas mask and recite something, usually their name and their code or social security number or something along those lines to uh, make sure they're breathing in the gas to see those effects and understand how that works. I hate gas. 
Oh. I'm, a, I'm a heavy breather. I take nice big breaths. I don't want anything to stop that. So trying to purge your mask and clear the gas out never really works properly. You know, you never get all the gas out. My last gas chamber, I was in Okinawa, Japan, and my mask that they gave me didn't work. And I didn't figure that out until I went into the gas chamber. Uh, so I was breathing gas the entire time. I didn't feel like waiting through the whole process again, so I just faked it. And I learned to breathe. You can breathe with gas. It's really hard, but it is. As long as you don't let the fear take over, it's doable. So like it gets all in your helmet and it gets all over your, your mask and you know your shirt and stuff like that and, and, it, and it burns for the next couple of minutes. And it's on your hands, so you know you wipe your nose and then you're like, ugh. <laughs> but yeah, no, I didn't I didn't like that at all. The stuff that the police use, I mean, that stuff that we just went through was was very strong. I mean, it was burning my armpits as soon as I walked in. It was bad, but I, I recovered pretty quick afterwards. I got that water on my eyes, and then I helped everybody else when they came out, try to guide them to the water and stuff. Now, as soon as they leave, the effects are pretty much done, and it shows them that if they go into a clear environment, they'll be fine, and it's something that you can fight through. With the way everything is now, Chicago, Atlanta, all the big major cities, we've got to be prepared for that. You guys, some of it just thinks it's a joke. It's not a joke. What happened, six two? Somebody leave the door to the cage open? Is that what happened? One messes up, we, we all mess up. That's how it is. We're brothers and sisters now. We, we're all one. You know, one makes a mistake, it falls on all of us. So that's, you know, the point of that. We got 90 seconds. There's been a couple things that we've had to do to pay for other people's mistakes, and it sucks, but I, I get it. You all are all out here in this hallway together because that is your cage. You share that responsibility. It's just all these things were just added up, or they're just like, wow, what the heck? We told you last week that we're going to start letting you guys chill out a little bit more because you know, we're nearing the end. As soon as that happened, it's like they gave us an inch and we took a mile. What, are you going to cry? No, sir. Put the crap away. Get back in your classrooms. Yes, sir. It's incredibly challenging. Probably, you know, being a dad more than anything else has taught me how to get people to do what you want in a way where they don't even realize that they're doing what you want because <laughs> there are some people who will fight back. Get your class in line. If you can't do it, let us know. We'll find somebody else who wants to take your spot. Are you sure about this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. For those who don't know the whole story, yesterday in the classroom, I looked at his hair and I said, you need to get a haircut. So a few seconds later, I'm not sure which recruit it was, one of them, Gregory, Gregory says, if he shaves his head, will we get the guide on back? And I said, I'm down with that. So we talked to the rest of the staff. Here he is, Murray is now, shaving. So I'm gonna hand this back over to you. You may return it to its rightful owner. Yes, sir. Good work, Murray. This coming week here, Monday, we start traffic stops. Oh, there's your violation. Next to domestics, that's one of the most dangerous things that we can do. I already know Sergeant Ricardo, he um, told us that things are going to change and flip on a dime. I may have pulled him over for a light or a, or a plate, and he may actually be drinking. He may have a beer or a... This, if anything, is something that we really need to grasp, and we need to be very proficient in traffic stops because it is by far the thing we do most often. So you need to be ready for anything and know how to handle it when it happens. You gotta be able to think on your feet real quick. We're all over you guys about this kind of stuff, about boom, 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 boom. And this is a lot of why, okay? There's nothing that dynamic at the traffic stop gone bad. It's arrest and custody, it's patrol techniques, it's criminal investigations, and now you're adding this element of driving in the sense that we simulate it to where Role players are driving around in cars on this expansive property just as you would be in the city of Virginia Beach and then a violation is going to occur and that recruit has to notice that violation. Virginia Tech. There's two kinds of stops. There's the unknown risk and the high risk. The high risk is I know for a fact that there's 
something felonious about this vehicle or this person or whatever the circumstance may be. Unknown risk is everybody else, and an unknown risk can turn into a high risk, and that's very stressful. Looks like a marijuana. So it's a big week for them. It's a lot of work. We, we start walking in that week. Writing summonses, learning what we can pull people over for and you know what to do when things go bad, I think is gonna be really important for us to learn. Any situation you can think of is gonna get thrown at you. And then as the week goes on, we start amping things up where um, the driver is not compliant, there's multiple occupants in the car, there's narcotics, and then we get into weapons where the recruits will be shot at in several different positions and situations. Walk backwards! And all of those scenarios come out of real live situations that we have encountered as law enforcement across the country. Some of the role players are gonna get shot up by recruits, and some of the recruits are gonna get shot up by the role players. And the point of it is, can you apply law? Can you react accordingly? Hello, sir. Sir, put the gun away, sir. And making sure that the recruit can apply these things before we send them to the street. They're bad people here. She had a gun on and she pointed at you and was gonna take your life. You've got to be able to make that decision. When I'm going through the scenarios, like I don't want to doubt myself. Like I want to be able to feel confident with my actions and decisions that I make. It just all relates back to like constitutional law, like knowing when to frisk an individual, when to frisk the vehicle, probable cause, reasonable suspicion, like all that stuff. So just, I know I'm gonna have to do like a refresher to make sure I like know my information. And like I said, just kind of just go out there and just be confident with my actions and decisions. Beautiful search, minus. You did just like this. With these scenarios and this training that's given to us, when you make that mistake, it's almost ingrained in your mind. You're never going back there. My main objective every night or every day or whenever, what shift I'm working is to go home. DUIs, huge. DUI is a full week, not just because of the laws, but because of the practical applications. Virginia Beach, we are a big producer of DUIs in the sense that no tolerance for it. They'll have the basis, obviously, of doing a traffic stop, and so then they'll learn what signs and things to look at for somebody that's driving impaired. DUI week is going to be teaching the recruits about DUI laws and teaching them the SFSTs, which are the standard field sobriety tests. The recruits get taught DUI law, how to apply it and how to use it, and then what happens after the arrest. One, two, three, my gun's here. My back now is turned. And then two nights during the week, they'll actually have what they call a wet lab, where citizens will come in, and a lot of times it ends up being recruits, family or friends, and we'll bring them down to the PBA, making sure that they have a designated driver, and we'll have them get drunk. And then the recruits will then do the SFSTs on these people. They'll do them when they were sober. Then they'll do them after a few drinks, after a few more drinks, and after a few more drinks. My uh, girlfriend's volunteering. You basically drink whatever you want, but they monitor it and they make sure that one, you're drinking enough because it doesn't do the recruits any good if you go in there and you're only a .02. So they're making sure that you hopefully at least achieve that minimum .08 level. And also, on the other hand, in case you get a little out of control, they'll make sure they cut you off in time. We don't need people passing out and falling, falling asleep. It's actually a really fun course. I had fun with it. I actually struggled with it when I first went through it. Just because it's a lot to remember. Your vertical gaze, your horizontal gaze. You know, your one foot stand, your nine steps turn, stuff like that. Attention to detail is very important when it comes to uh, stopping somebody for driving under the influence of alcohol because the testing procedures, the time restraints, and we have a DUI check sheet that if you don't follow literally to the word, your case can be dismissed in court. So it's a major lesson, life lesson for even our drinkers that come in, they get something out of it as well. So it's very twofold and I like it. Oh, that makes me feel ashamed of myself. It's actually an area that I'm highly experienced in. I spent three years on our traffic safety unit arresting 95 to 100 DUIs a year. So I'm very, very well versed in DUI law and in the SFSTs. So keep that good distance and always have him on your left. MPO Kenworthy is the only one that I had never met until I attended this academy. He can be relaxing at times, but also he reminds you when you need to be serious. He reminds you that you must instill discipline in everything you do. I see the qualities I want to emulate merely in my instructors from MPO Kenworthy. I see his candidness. You're not applying the tools and methods that are being given to you. For MPO Johannesson, I see the quality of compassion. For MPO Bender, I see the quality of loyalty. Okay, so uh, tonight we are presenting Recruit Velasquez with a uh, uh, a token of the academy staff and the uh, academy classes um, 
gratitude, I guess. We got information that uh, one of our recruits' moms had passed away because of the, the stress with him. We asked him, obviously, if there was anything that we could do. We gave him our condolences from the staff, and we made it very clear that if there was something that we could do as a staff to help him out to kind of ease um, the pain that he was going to be going through, then, then we wanted to know. And during the wet lab, we decided that we would um, give him this card. For John Velasquez, will you join us up front, please? Stand right here, sir. Right here, sir. Um, the class has come together. We've got you a, a card for tonight um, from Academy staff and, uh, and Lita staff. Um, if you would do us the honor in, in opening that card, please, sir. He had no idea that this was coming, that we were going to do it, or anything about it. So it was a complete shock to him. And when we issued that to him, we had him read the card and explain um, what we did for him as a staff. This was everybody involved from PD&T as well as his classmates. Mere words can never say enough at a time like these. Okay. Um, mere words don't, but actions, I think, speak volumes compared to um, what words can do. And the actions of the lead of staff and your class has um, rallied behind you and we would like to present you with $660 that we have collected to um, help you with the things that you need to get done back home. And he broke down into tears and was very, very thankful. That's what family does. And that's what family yep. is about. Okay? Your entire staff and Class 6 too stepped up and did exactly what we should do for you. So it was an emotional time, but it was, it needed to be done, and so we made it happen. Today's courtroom demeanor, you have me all day. Yay. Woo. Nothing? Yeah. Wow. All right, I'm getting ready to start my introduction and I look through the double doors and here comes my two recruits and they have a cake in their hand with candles lit and balloons and all this shenanigans and they came in and they sang happy birthday and it was they got me is what I told them. I said all right that's well played well played you guys got me <laughs> if you want a piece of cake they're gonna cut and pass because I got to get through this PowerPoint so as uh, we get through this PowerPoint eat away yeah, we're already starting late. no trap I really thrive on courtroom demeanor because that's where their reputation kind of begins and I go into very good detail about how their integrity and their reputation it lies on them once they walk in that courtroom. Three P's in the courtroom. Preparation. It's on you guys to prepare for court. You know, do, their uniform, how does it look? Is it, do they look like a soup sandwich or are they dressed professional, their uniform squared away and um, they're respectful to the judge, you know, sunglasses aren't hanging off their um, lapel and, and jackets and things like that. Dirty shoes, I mean, you name it. You're gonna see it, you're gonna see it, okay? Don't be that guy. Okay. Courtroom demeanor, you know, how to testify a case, how to behave in court, how to properly testify to something from your summons. And how important it is to testify to the facts of the case and not go out, outside of that. All right, so things we're going to cover, preparation for testimony just in general, all right? We're very detailed in how important it is to testify and give a very detailed description of what happened to the judge and everyone in the courtroom so that everyone can understand what happened that day and then um, we put them through a mock trial. All the good work you can do on the street can immediately be overdone if you don't have the right presence of mind when you step into that courtroom, step in front of the judge. Uh, you know, a good defense attorney can overrule multiple days worth of work in 20 minutes. Every single one of you have to prosecute a case. You got to pick your own misdemeanor charge, you got to pick your partner that you were going to accuse of that. And it was, in fact, uh, Miss Whitney Andre here that we are charging with possession of a controlled substance. 
And so one of us plays the judge and one of us plays the defense attorney and we give them a hard time, but they learn from the mistakes that they make. Uh, my memory serves me correctly, Your Honor. Motion to strike, I'm not understanding as to why uh, this officer has written a summons for the possession of heroin, why, why you would write a summons for a felony and uh, bring it into general district court. They overturned basically everybody's case. It was really interesting to see how you think you know the elements of a crime and then somebody with any knowledge can just whittle apart your, your whole case. You said went right through. Could you please explain what went right through means? It really kind of helps them get the nerves out of we're not judges and attorneys, but it allows them to get up in front of that stand in a controlled environment and testify and raise their hand and swear under oath. So it turns out to be a, a really fun day for them and, as well as for us. He just admitted he's willing to admit it. He's a victim of a crime and you just charge him instead. Virtual. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told that you do a rather last month, you're really starting to let down your guard a little bit as an academy instructor and accepting them as a peer. We will actually take a trip up to Richmond to the Holocaust Museum. The trip up there was nice because the instructors were getting more and more personable with us. Yeah, the trip was interesting for its dichotomy in that regards because the bus trip up was fun. The instructors were, you know, switching seats, you know, getting into our personal lives. And then we got to the Holocaust Museum and it's a very somber setting and there's a lot of emotion to be felt there. Ladies and gentlemen, first I want to thank you very, very much for being here. There's several ways many of these people survived. They go, they get the tour of the museum, and then they have a little bit of time to kind of walk around and, and check out things on their own. I think when we all initially went, we just thought it was going to be just a chance to, to do a road trip. Uh, we didn't really understand the meaning behind it. History is important because if you don't know where the heck you are, how the heck do you know where you're going to go? For most folks, it's pretty enlightening. It's because one, they've either bypassed that era of history in their own studies. And if they're open and open-minded enough to to see it, then they they kind of get that aha moment during during the presentation. All 14 of my aunts, Andrew, all 14 of my 14 of my uncles, all of my cousins, all of my distant relatives, all of my grandparents, every single one of them were slaughtered in the Holocaust. I remember there was one wall full of kids drawings and my son is young and he does sort of the same sort of drawings and it was just uh, yeah, I had an actual real emotional moment about that and then you realize that you have a responsibility to the citizens you protect as well. You have to protect them from everything. The recruits would learn empathy and that side of police work. With power can come corruption and this is what can happen when you're in an unchecked environment. We have to remember that we're there to protect and serve, you know, not oppress people. And it was just a, a stark reminder of how bad things can go. You're more enlightened than you when you first came in here. You have more knowledge, you have more wisdom. But it's absolutely useless until you do something with it. Our goal is to it that they have an open mind when they go there and they take something back. You know, if we don't know about our history, then we're kind of destined to repeat it. In my 11 year career on the department, I've been on the Yonah Guard for nine. Now, when we get close to the memorial, I will ask for a moment of silence. You better not let me hear you say a word. We do ceremonial things for parades. We present colors for conferences, academy ceremonies, award ceremonies, and of course, the main reason why most people join the Honor Guard is to be a part of the team that lays our brothers and sisters to rest. I think it's important for our recruit class to understand what we do and why we do it. And having our memorial down at the oceanfront, I have started taking the classes for a run. It's a five mile run that they know about. It's kind of an eye-opening experience for them to actually put eyes on our memorial with names from people on our department that we've lost. And we discuss the stories and the incidences that happened 
for them when they were killed in the line of duty. And I talk about the fact that they're at that stage, we're right at graduation, typically right in that time frame. And I explain to them that they are getting ready to be a part of the biggest family they'll ever be a part of. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is your law enforcement police memorial. The police foundation got together and went out, got a lot of sponsors to put money together to build this for us, for the sheriff's department, for state PD. This is ours. And I go into that a little bit further and into why I joined the Honor Guard is because of that right there. It's a way for me to pay back respect to my brothers and sisters that were killed in the line of duty and make sure that, uh, number one, their family is taken care of and they know that we are there for them, not just during that traumatic event and that time frame, but that they will never be forgotten. If I leave you with anything 6-2, I leave you with this. You are, again, about to be a part of the biggest family you'll ever be a part of. And it doesn't matter whether you like each other, whether you want to go have drinks together. It doesn't matter. When you put that uniform on day in and day out, you are a part of a family. It was awesome. Ever since then, I've already considered wanting to join the Honor Guard. You know, you hear the stories of Houston. the things that happened and, you know, you sit and think, what can I do? Virginia Beach Police Department, end of watch, June 23rd, 2003. I think it's a great tribute to have the memorial we have and especially those that have the red patch for Honor Guard and especially MPO Johannesson and knowing how much it means to her. I look up to her a lot so I really respect that she does that and hopefully I get the opportunity to do it as well and maybe stand next to her. When you leave here today, whether you like us or not, whether we taught you anything at all, that you understand one thing, we will always be here for you no matter what and I think our staff proved that with Velasquez in your class. I hope to God we never have to put any of y'all on this wall. I hope we don't have to add another name to this wall. But reality, guys, it's going to happen. All right, guys and girls, today is the day, the next three days, okay? Just like I explained to you, all right? These right here, this is probably the most important out of all your training that you had up to this point. This right here can make you or break you, okay? This could send you home tonight. KSAs, knowledge, skills, and ability scenarios. KSAs is an interesting three days because it ties everything they've learned all together. The recruits are given their own training car, given a unit number, and give them calls for service. And the entire Creed facility is used and they get dispatched just like they would be getting dispatched on the street. When the call comes out and it dispatches 110 to go to, uh, you know, whatever location, you're gonna go back, grab a set of keys, I need you to just wear iPro, okay? KSAs are broken up into 16 different scenarios, ranging from noise complaints to death scenes, and this is where they have no help from instructors. That's all on them. Use everything you've learned to complete the scenario. If you need to be a command presence with an individual, become a command presence with that individual. It would be nice that we're on our own for it because you can't fall on someone else knowing what to do. You gotta know what to do or be able to wait to figure yourself out and get through it. This is crazy. What are you doing, sir? What are you doing, sir? What are you doing, sir? What are you doing? We actually have dispatchers come down from the dispatch center and dispatch whatever unit the recruit is to a scenario. Owners reporting that there is a suspicious vehicle parked in front of the garage with a subject possibly sleeping inside. So if I'm 124 Alpha in this situation, uh, you know, dispatched 124 Alpha, and I would say 124 Alpha, we need you to respond to integrity and pride for a suspicious person. And then the recruit would drive over to that location and deal with whatever call for service that may be. Thing is, you need to be listening for that call sign because that's who you're known as today, not your recruit number, nothing like that. You're known as that unit number. That's who you're gonna be. They see the multitasking of it all. So they get dispatched from the dispatcher. They have to respond to the scene that they're going to. They have to figure out what they have and how they're gonna handle okay. it. And then they have to clear it with the dispatcher as well. You're dispatched to a suspicious person in the park. So there's all these things going on. 
and in the middle of that they have to pay attention to their radio because the dispatcher will call them and ask them for a safety check. Papa, Alpha, uniform. So they're not only having to handle whatever situation is in front of them, but they're having to multitask by using the radio and also responding to whatever location that they're going to. And for some people, KSAs is an aha moment. So if we've gone this whole time, constitutional law, driving, firearms, defensive tactics, being sprayed with OC, the gas house, where we've used some munitions, where you have been shot at and you've had to shoot back. If you haven't yet thought, hmm, I don't know if this is for me. This is like that last hurdle for you to say, okay, I really want you to take this all in. Is this what you want to do? Because it's what their life is going to be. I didn't pass this one that I just came from. So I have to redo this one. At first, in every academy class, that first day, they are so overwhelmed, they don't know what to do with themselves. And so that's where we come in as the squad leaders and coach and mentor them and kind of walk them through things that they may have messed up on or make a mistake or have forgotten and things like that. And as the second and third day come along when they get the hang of the radio and the dispatching and responding to those calls and things like that, they tend to really do pretty well with it overall as a whole. I did not threaten to kill you, I threatened to kill myself. I know I didn't do well. Um, I felt like I had a lot of confidence going in. Officer Sharp, Virginia Beach Police Department, here because the silent alarm went off. And then you get put in that real situation and it suddenly all the wheels come off the bus and you're just grasping at memories of things that you half sort of know that you should do maybe could do because guess what that's cool right yes okay. what about this yes what's up um i thought i was really stellar squared away ready for it and once you get put in that situation where you're really relying on everything you've been taught and taught so quickly um, it's actually kind of hard to bring it all back really fast like that in a situation especially with the high stress where you're being monitored you've got your you know, your MPOs are there, they're watching you, they're judging you, you've got the, the instructor there, he's also evaluating you, and you just, you're trying to figure out at that point if you can actually do the job. I don't know what it is, there's something. Some thought process that doesn't jive with this particular scenario. I didn't know really what to expect. Some I did very well on. Okay, and this is your vehicle? And some not so much. Just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. It's, it definitely was an eye opener to go through them one on one and realize the mistakes that you could make on the street that could really affect your career and your life. Sir. There was one certain KSA uh, that I was on. It was a rape case, and. It was, I would say, ultra realistic with the, the role players that we had there, the way she was yelling and the things she was saying. And it just kind of sinks in that this is real. They get a pretty good idea of a day to day of what could happen. And then, really, after that, our end of the year DCJS test. KSA is a practical exam. The DCGS test is an academic exam to make sure they can meet the minimum standard as far as demonstrating their knowledge of all the DCGS objectives that were taught throughout the academy. You really start to see that they have made such an improvement from where they started to where they are with physical appearance, confidence level, and just an overall sense of achievement. Because let's face it, this is not easy. This academy is built to be physically and mentally taxing. We have a day and a half typically before they actually graduate to prep them and kind of take lead in that role because of the drill, the marching, the facing movements and things like that. And being in the honor guard, I take lead in that preparation. So we have the preparation, we go through everything so they're comfortable, they're ready to go. The last day is a little bit more joking. What's going on? That is awesome. Very casual. We typically uh, allow them to wear their academy t-shirts that they have made that show who they are and what they represent. Going through the academy, uh, the instructors had a little motto saying, you're either going to get smart or you're going to get strong, meaning you're going to figure out what we want and how we want it, or we're going to go outside and, and play games, burpees, runs, sprints, mud crawls, whatever and they said that'll make you strong. Well, our class was notorious for messing up the simplest of tasks. So, uh, as a joke, we said, well, we're not getting smarter, so I guess we're gonna get stronger. So, we got strong was the class motto. 
every academy class, uh, there's three honorees. Top academics, top shooter, and overall top recruit. Top academics, Mark Managio. <laughs> top shooter, Thomas Rowland. Well done. You guys had some pretty good competition with this large, large group uh, across the board. Well done in every evolution. Top recruit. <coughs> Not one thing sets this recruit off. Um, it's a culmination of things. Willingness to succeed, willingness to persevere, team player, academic, shooting, scenario based, uh, leadership qualities. Uh, it's not taken lightly, as you guys have a tremendous amount of talent in this class. But after speaking with the squad leaders and taking everything even from orientation to today, uh, we voted on a recruit that we think has embodied everything that we are looking for as a police officer, everything we look for as a human, uh, and everything that we look for that is, that is, that is good in today's society. Class 6-2, give a round of applause for John Sharp. It was a surprise. It was an honor. Um, one of the things that I did during the Academy was I really wanted to make sure that everybody who wanted to make it could. And I guess, you know, a couple of the instructors saw that I was spending all this extra time and energy, you know, trying to make sure that these other people were making it through too, and they thought that that said a lot about you know, just sort of my leadership potential. I think that's why they gave it to me. I'm not sure still. You know, they said I went through a lot personally and I still made it through the Academy. The graduation is almost near. I, I can't wait to take the oath. Up to this point, I've had fun. I've had fun. I've, I've met people here that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily hang out with, you know, if I was back home. I would actually say I, I, I've met a couple of my best friends here. Throughout this whole process, you know, you're looking down this tunnel and you're seeing this light thinking it's this train, you know, because you don't know what's coming. Um, but I feel as if me, as an individual uh, throughout this entire process, along with, with several other recruits, now realize that it's, it's the light at the end of the tunnel. I was really excited once I got my higher letter for the academy, but now it's graduation. Once that happens, it means I really reach my goal in life to become a police officer. Department order, arms! It's a little bittersweet because, you know, we want to get out there and we want to hit the streets and we want to start making a difference in our community, but we're always going to have this time together. I can't believe that I just made it through the worst six months of my life. <laughs> We get this group of young men and women and we break them down and we really see where they are mentally and physically and to see the transformation from the beginning to the end is just a, an amazing experience. There's that light at the end of the tunnel and that light keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's this amazing sense of pride, accomplishment, you feel like you've done something. Again, great job, I'm proud of you guys. And, um, a couple hours from now. Officers and they all day in, day out for six months. So, great job. Thank you, sir. I just can't wait to, to be my classes, to get my badge pinned. I'm going to know that I, I fought hard to get there, and I'm going to fight hard to keep it.
you're there and it almost feels unreal for a lot of it. You're just trying to be in the right place, be in the right uniform. Everything's got to be clean and pressed and ironed and your badges and your buttons you haven't put on before, they've all got to be in the right spot. They've all got to be shiny, free fingerprints. They wear Class A pants and they wear a long sleeve Class A shirt with a tie and they have their name tag and their badge and the American flag and we do a final inspection right before graduation and it's kind of a rewarding thing because they get that inspection in week one or two of the academy where we just tear them apart. So when we do that final inspection it's kind of rewarding for them and rewarding for us to see again how much they grow from start to finish and how sharp they look and again the confidence that we built in them to put that uniform on and know that they can be successful and survive anything that's thrown at them. You look back at who you started with and who's still there. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking that, I think the easy part's over with, now it's for real. I couldn't begin to describe the feelings that I've already had throughout this career that I'm getting ready to fully embark on. Having your family and friends out there watching, that was really humbling and really exciting. Recruits, would you stand and raise your right hand, please? repeat after me, on my honor, on my honor. I, will never betray my badge. I will never betray my badge, my integrity, my, integrity. my, character. my character, or the public trust. The public trust. Chief, it is my pleasure to present to you the officers of the 62nd Virginia Beach Police Department Academy for the presentation of their certificates. We take those who choose to come to the Academy and try to develop them to be the absolute best that they can be when they leave here. Officer Andrew Michael Houston. To me, I, I kind of want to be a combination officer in the community, but I also want to be that proactive officer that is getting the drugs off the street, that is getting the guns, that is catching the criminals. Officer Ryan Manette. I want to be one of the ones that's active, you know, get whatever I can find off the streets, you know, so my kids don't wind up picking it up later on. Officer Jennifer Pate. I want to be an officer that's fair, go into those communities that may have a negative view of police officers and hopefully change their mind. Officer John Sharp. You know, you sit there and you try and think about the different types of police officers that there are. And, you know, I've always thought that I'm going to be officer friendly. Each one's got their own style that they're going to bring to the table. When they leave here, it's not my job to ensure that they can go out there by themselves and do the job. That's not my job. My job is to get them to the point where they're successful at their PTO phase. The real learning happens when they're in the car with your PTOs day in and day out. When gunfire erupts, we are running toward that gunfire. And to know that that brother or sister that's to the left or right of us is all in, that's amazing. Now it's real. Now you're on the streets trying to not mess up. As class president, one of the things you get to do is do the graduation speech. As we close this chapter in the story of our careers, we look back at, the, at all the events we've gone through. Mostly good, some bad, uh, and few were just hilarious. However, I think that we'll mostly remember the bond that we created not only with each other, but also with our squad leaders. They showed us the true meaning of commitment, honor, duty, and attention to detail. Class 62, we have proven that, in the words of NPO Philippone, if you believe it, you can achieve it. After I gave it, somebody remarked that the only person that talked the longest up there was me. Longer than the chief, which, you know, I had a lot of people to thank, had to, you know, that were integral to the class. And I just want to make sure everybody was, was recognized for their efforts. My family's not from here, they all came from Michigan. You know, my dad realized, oh crap, you know, this is, she's, you know, a real officer. And he said as soon as he saw us march out, I guess my mother-in-law told me he would never admit it, that he lost it. She's just such an amazing woman. Um, she's strong, she's loving, she's caring, she's a wife, a mother, just best daughter-in-law. Uh, very, very proud. I had my husband be a New York City police officer for 20 years. He survived 9-11. To see my son go through this, I'm so proud of him. I'm here to see Mark Managio. It doesn't surprise me at all that he's been able to go through it and succeed. Happy for him and proud of him. Brian is following in a 
tradition. He's going to do a great job here. Proud, but a little scared, but I think he'll be good. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad he put a lot of hard work into it. We've spent six months together. We've laughed harder than we've ever, ever laughed. We've cried. We've burned. We had trouble breathing. We were tased. You have all of these monumental life occasions that connect you for forever. I know that my brothers and sisters in the academy will be going their own separate ways. There's four different police stations in the city, and I'll probably uh, miss them just because of our unit cohesion. It was a full turnaround of how we were from the beginning to, to when we graduated. Were we together perfectly? No, but what family is? And we've lost our mind! On your face, plank it out! Right side of the hallway! Right. I look forward to getting in a routine, getting that schedule, and actually getting past the PTO phase. It's an honor, it really is. And to be part of that brotherhood of blue, there's nothing like it.